Welcome everyone to the ninth edition of the Atlantic Council front page or hashtag AC front page. This is our premier, our, our premier live ideas forum for global leaders. A special welcome today to our viewers on Politico Live and on Europe by satellite. Uh, I'm Fred Kemp, I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. And what we've learned through this period of time is there really isn't social distance, there's geographic distance, but we've been bringing together the global Atlantic Council community as never before through these platforms. We've been hearing from extraordinary leaders on uh, hashtag AC front page, ranging from presidents to prime ministers to philanthropists to leaders of major international institutions. Most recently, we've hosted Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, uh, President of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, the IMF Executive Director, uh, Kristalina Georgieva as well. Today, and in that spirit, we're honored and delighted uh, to host uh, one of the most uh, influential regulators and uh, leaders in the world, um, the uh, European Commission Executive Vice President for a Europe fit for the digital age, Margrethe Vestager. Uh, I, and, and that is the title, uh, Madam Executive Vice President, and it's a really inspiring title. She'll be discussing not only the new challenges for regulatory and competition policy in digital age and post-COVID-19 uh, economic recovery, but also the drive for what some are calling digital sovereignty in Europe. On both sides of the Atlantic, the COVID-19 pandemic and ensuing economic crisis has accelerated debates about the role of technology, especially digital technology, the dependency on global supply chains and how to strengthen our control over sourcing, production, and movement of all sorts of products, uh, low tech and high tech. The geopolitical implications of uh, the globalized economy, business models, and trade and investment flows, and what to degree foreign actors should have influence are a large part of that debate. This is, of course, not a new discussion, but I think we're seeing a new focus and vigor and rigor in that discussion on both sides of the Atlantic. In Europe, uh, this debate is in, inextricably linked with the broader question in the debate over strategic autonomy and how this relates uh, to the tricky question of digital or technology uh, sovereignty. Uh, how Europe defines its digital world in the coming months and years will have a significant impact, not only on major American businesses with large profit centers in Europe, but also on the transatlantic relationship as the bedrock of both of our strategic positions in a fast changing geopolitical environment and then clearly uh, on uh, our relations, uh, the US relations with China, European relation with China, and also the transatlantic relationship together uh, in regard to China. At the, at, at the Atlantic Council, we are working at the forefront of these issues and have been for a while. Uh, we will be launching a report, actually it is on our site already, but we'll be launching at 10.30 in the morning uh, uh, on this platform on Thursday, uh, you're all invited to that. And the issue brief is called the European Union and the search for digital sovereignty, building fortress Europe or preparing for a new world, building fortress Europe or preparing for a new world. Uh, it's co-authored by our fellows, Fran Burwell and Ken Prop, and it comes from our Future Europe Initiative, which is so capably led by, by Ben Haddad. It builds on our long-term work on digital uh, issues and the transatlantic space and explores complex issues of digital sovereignty from transatlantic perspective. So please do all attend that event also on, uh, on Thursday. Uh, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce a woman who really needs very little introduction. Uh, she has been at the forefront of thinking about the competitive world, fair economies. She's led tough investigations, not only into some of the world's largest companies, but also into practices by European member states She's defied pressures at various times from Berlin, Paris, Washington, and many other places in the world uh, on major merger plans and other competitive issues. Uh, and it is just my pleasure uh, to, uh, to have her with us today. She's been recognized as one of the world's most influential regulators, previously as European Commissioner for Competition between 2014 and 2019, and now in her expanded uh, portfolio as Executive Vice President of the Commission. So let me now turn, uh, turn this virtual stage over to Ryan Heath, senior editor of Politico and author of Global Translations who will moderate the discussion. Ryan, let me pass to you.
Thank you so much, Fred. And it is wonderful to be back again chatting with you, Madam Executive Vice President. <laughs> Such a mouthful, that title, but well deserved. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us here. I thought maybe we could start by setting the scene uh, about Europe's economic strategy for those who don't follow it in, in detail every day. And so the EU is obviously putting a big emphasis on green. Some people don't know that they're putting a big emphasis on digital policy as well. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on those two twin pillars of the EU's economic strategy, um, especially given that digital becomes an increasingly heated uh, political topic in these times. Well, you are indeed right to say that it is a strategy. Uh, it's a strategy for Europe that has three main elements. The first is to be uh, the climate neutral continent by 2050. Uh, the second is to make sure that we make the best use of, uh, of digital technologies in all its breadth. And uh, thirdly, that it may, we make sure that we have an economy that works for people, that people feel included in their societies and they see that the economy is working for them. Uh, when we were hit uh, by the corona uh, virus, uh, that, of course, was an, an unprecedented uh, crisis. Um, people lost their lives. Uh, it has been, uh, been, been a very uh, tragic and very hard uh, period of time. Uh, and then followed with an economic uh, crisis. And, and we've seen the downturn uh, in the European economy. Um, so we had to consider what to do. Uh, but the thing was that, why would you rebuild the old world uh, when we wanted a new one? So we have put sort of the recovery into our strategic framework to say we will recover green and digital uh, by creating societies that really works for people. Uh, and those sort of twin transitions, green and digital, uh, will be uh, the job creator uh, in the years to come. Uh, already now, uh, member states have agreed on the support of 540 billion euros. Uh, they are operational. Uh, on a support program for uh, short-term uh, unemployment. Uh, and now uh, the Commission has tabled a, a recovery and long-term budget of a total of 1.18 uh, uh, trillion uh, euros uh, front-loaded uh, in the coming years. And that is indeed coming from, from a, a very strong realization that Europe can only recover strong and fast if we recover together. So we will put in motion both sort of economics and, and regulation that will push uh, for green, but also when it comes to digital to make most of uh, European uh, assets. And, uh, and they of course comes from the very strong sort of manufacturing core because the business to business technology is an, is an overlooked um, uh, talent, virtue, assets uh, of the European economy, realizing of course that in in, uh, in some of the digital eras, um, it has not been Europe's finest moments. And one of the reasons of that is that we haven't pushed a single market, which is why the push for a single market in all its dimension, both for goods, services, and, and indeed digital services, that is also the core of our economic strategy uh, for the years to come. That's a perfect jumping off point to my follow-up question. Uh, the Atlantic Council has a paper out on the search for digital sovereignty. I think you prefer a word like autonomy, uh, although they're kind of overlapping concepts. I was wondering, how can you clarify how the EU sees itself being able to innovate in that sort of way in terms of policy or also in the industry without messing up the apolitical role of competition policy, which you're still in charge of? and nor the provision of a level playing field for every company that wants to come to Europe, because there are tensions there with those ideas, I think. Uh, yes, uh, indeed. Um, first, to, to, to be autonomous, uh, for me, that means that you have, uh, you have choices. You can choose what kind of society you want to be, what kind of economy you want to be. Uh, European uh, member states, they are welfare states. Universal health care, universal access to education, uh, a social safety net. Uh, we have a social market economy, so the regulator, the, the legislator, uh, the democracy plays uh, quite a role when it comes to making sure that we have decent working condition, uh, environmental legislation, all of that. But the paradox, of course, is that we have been able to make those choices uh, because of prosperity. Mm -hmm. 
because then we can afford it. And that prosperity comes from openness. Uh, Europe is the preferred trading partner uh, for the uh, entire world, 80 countries in, in particular, the world's biggest trading bloc. So obviously, we would want to balance sort of this idea of pushing for uh, autonomy uh, while still being open. So we will coin this as, as an open strategic uh, autonomy, also to say that we focus on a number of areas. Um, and indeed, uh, your question is very good. But the thing is, of course, that actually uh, fair competition, a level playing field will help us do that because businesses that are challenged, they will be innovative. Uh, businesses that know that competitors can produce uh, maybe better prices, maybe more innovative products, they will do their best. And in all the value chains, of course, you need, um, you need competitive prices as well. So, so for us, uh, competition law enforcement is part of the recovery and is part of uh, enabling a more assertive Europe. That being said, uh, of course, we have a, a number of, uh, of, um, of projects. Uh, one obvious one to, to mention would be the important project of, of common European interest on, on, um, uh, on microelectronics, uh, sensors, uh, things that are not uh, produced and not available in Europe, where we would want to, to push innovation, but where the risk would be too big for, for one single company to take. So state support would come in uh, and many states would be engaged. Second uh, part of, of, of that would be also such a project on batteries, uh, where companies and member states come together, uh, quite a lot of support, uh, but also with an obligation uh, to share the knowledge that is being created. So and we can sort of can... occupy something between free and fair competition and openness, and then the transparency and the control of aid being handed out in a way that doesn't fragment uh, the single market, because we really need that for the recovery. Is the analogy there that those sort of projects and, and that level of research support, is that in some way a civilian uh, analogy of what the US military uh, research budget does. Do you, do you frame it in those sorts of terms when you sit down and develop the ideas and, 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 and justify it in terms of its market impacts? Well, I, I think here there is a lot of, uh, of sort of um, almost envy of, uh, of DARPA uh, and all that has been achieved uh, with those funds and the flexibility of those funds, uh, because I think there is a lot of room for, for, for testing, for bold ideas, for, for really, you know, try something new. Uh, this is not exactly the same uh, thing. Uh, I think we have some funds that has a, a sort of a maybe the same sort of atmosphere to it, uh, but, but we do not have the same thing as, uh, as the DAPA uh, fund. Uh, but we would want to push uh, things in that direction, uh, but we do not have that uh, in full scale. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we broaden it out a little bit now more to uh, geopolitics and globalization for a minute. I know you've just had the EU-China summit and the commission really uh, put itself out there and said it wanted to be a geopolitical commission. Uh, I also heard some criticism. Last week I was talking with Joshua Wong, for example, he leads the protest movement in Hong Kong, and he went really quite far and said that the EU is engaging almost in appeasement policy uh, in its stance on Hong Kong or not taking economic action against China in that regard. But your president, Ursula von der Leyen, she says human rights are non-negotiable. You've done an investment screening tool. So I, I was wondering who's right there? Is Joshua Wong entitled uh, to be frustrated at the EU on China? Well, that, that, of course, is difficult for me to judge uh, because he's in a very difficult situation uh, and very specific situation. Uh, if you heard uh, the president, uh, our president uh, yesterday in, in the press point after the summit, uh, I think you would agree with me that this was a very uh, assertive precedent. Uh, it has been a summit uh, that followed uh, after we a year ago made the EU-China uh, strategy. Uh, where we once and for all sort of uh, retired the idea that China is a developing economy. Uh, China is, is a partner, for instance, on, on climate change, uh, fighting that, uh, but also a strategic competitor, both when it comes to, to, to the market and economics, but also when it comes to the system. Uh, and I think that came uh, clearly across uh, in the summit. Uh, the, the press point was a, a clear reflection uh, of the debates uh, during the summit. Uh, for me, this is very important. 
uh, because uh, we ask, for instance, to give you an example, uh, we ask uh, businesses in Europe to compete uh, fair and square on, uh, on the merits of their products, quality, affordable prices, uh, innovation, uh, without taxpayers uh, picking up their bills. Which is why, of course, it's important that if they have competitors in Europe that comes with foreign subsidies, uh, for their production costs, uh, for their in investment that is uncontrolled, unchecked, with no transparency. Well, we would want to have tools uh, to make that transparent to see if that, on balance, uh, serves European interests. And, and I think that's a very good way of seeing we, we take it from the rhetorics uh, and try to be operational. Uh, to have the right tool to say, we want to push fair competition, but for all of those businesses who compete fair and square, we also stand up for them if they are faced with unfair competition. Mm -hmm. it, it does indeed seem very much that the globalization that we knew in recent decades is, is under threat and that it requires more of a joining up of your policy work with other policy areas to make sure that the whole thing doesn't fall apart, let's say. Um, and I know that there are more governments and more people uh, afraid of the rise of, of China there. Um, how do you see competition policy fitting into all of those other political needs and that, that need for a holistic response to those globalization threats? Um, well, the, the strength of, of competition law enforcement is, is, of course, that it builds on the rule of law, uh, that we are always responsible uh, to the courts. Uh, that we have a case law, that we have uh, equal treatment uh, principles, and that we never, ever compromise on those. Uh, so obviously there are uh, strict uh, limits as to, as to how competition policy uh, as such can be a tool uh, when it comes to geopolitics. But to be competitive for, for businesses who, who grow, uh, who scale up here, um, uh, fair competition for them is, is a tool in their scale up. Uh, I think there is an example after the Great Depression in, in the US um, where competition laws were, were relaxed or, or paused. Um, and later there was a, a, a recognition of the fact that that, that had actually uh, delayed the recovery uh, after the Great Depression. And, and I think that's a good example of uh, why a, a vigilant competition law enforcement uh, is a benefit in itself to make you competitive, to make sure that you are aware that you are being challenged. So in that respect, of course, it's important. And the second thing is that uh, competition law enforcement will have to be uh, in its time. Uh, we have an, an ongoing, very intense debate uh, about uh, competition law enforcement in, in a digital era. Uh, because markets are changing. The market dynamics, they're different. They are faster. You have marginal prices uh, approaching zero. You have network effects. You have the data-driven economy. So, of course, uh, we need to change with the times that we're in, but, but we will not negotiate and we will not compromise on this being built on the rule of law and the responsibility uh, for the courts in order to make sure that we have equal treatment between businesses. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another really important uh, part of your work in around, around state aid and dealing with those government subsidies. And here in the US, there is a vigorous debate around how to be transparent around bailout money. There's trillions now sloshing around um, in all of these short term measures to make sure the economy doesn't collapse. I was wondering, how worried are you that some companies or other vested interests might misuse these short term protections to uh, essentially save themselves when they, they don't need to be saved or can't be saved uh, and where they're not actually delivering the social outcomes that were intended? And, and, and what's your role in making sure that doesn't happen? Uh, here we have a, a shared responsibility with, with member states. Uh, we say that businesses cannot be, be helped uh, if they were uh, in difficulty before uh, the COVID uh, crisis, the corona crisis hit us. Um, but if they have uh, issues, if they lose their business, well, they can have some kind of compensation also if in difficulty, so they have a fair chance of, of recovering. Uh, the important thing here is, of course, that sort of the temporary framework of rules is, is indeed temporary, 
uh, and that the different schemes that we are approving, uh, that they have uh, sunset clauses. Um, where it really bites is when we go into uh, recapitalization of businesses. Uh, businesses who may not anymore have, uh, have market access and who need new capital. Uh, those, of course, have to be healthy, well-run, viable businesses. Otherwise, there is a risk, of course, that taxpayers will, will lose their money. Uh, and taxpayer money will have to come with strings attached. Mm -hmm. So if you go in and recapitalize a business with taxpayers' money, uh, that comes with the consequence of a ban of bonuses of senior management, uh, acquisition bans, uh, dividend bans, if it's a full uh, state recapitalization. Uh, in order for the business to have an incentive to push out uh, the state again. Uh, and of course, also, if these are big businesses uh, in a dominant position, that there will be uh, remedies uh, for potential disturbance of, uh, of competition. Um, and that is because it's a, it's a difficult, uh, if it's a different thing to have taxpayers' money sitting as capital compared to providing liquidity. And this is, of course, why we are uh, much more precise and, and attach many more strings if it is capital rather than, than liquidity. Uh, but also just saying that in a situation like this, of course, member states should support their businesses. Uh, member states are closing down economies, closing the doors of businesses. Of course, there is a responsibility to make sure that those businesses can survive when it's a government decisions that deprive them of, uh, of customers. Does that turn you into the bad cop? I was trying to think of the analogy. Are you the bad cop here or the overworked triage nurse who's trying to <laughs> <laughs> all of these endless nurses? I think you should leave uh, both those occupations uh, to the real thing, at least out of respect of the hardworking nurse. Fair enough, fair enough. I want to remind everyone watching, you can pose questions in the Q&A function and we're going to start getting to them in just a, a couple of minutes. You're almost through with me, Commissioner. Um, now, when it comes to the big tech companies, sometimes you're criticized for being anti-American. Um, I'll push back on that. I don't think that's true. I think it's just that a lot of the big tech companies happen to be American. So that's mm. my two cents there. But what we have certainly seen from this pandemic is that those companies are the big winners from the pandemic. Uh, and they certainly are the most able to have creative tax strategies as well, for example. And it feels like all of that is coming to a head in social and political terms. Uh, if we think back to 2008, it was that the banks were too big to fail and then the bill was sent to the taxpayers. And somehow it's almost like now the big tech companies are too big to compete against because they've got this huge head of steam. And, you know, if you're a small player, you know, they'll just buy you or copy you. And, uh, you know, they're so big, they, they don't need to necessarily innovate in the way uh, that a, a more populated marketplace would. So I'll stop there. But how much of that does that worry you? And, and, and have you got things in your toolbox where you're going to try and address that in coming years? Um... Well, first, I think very positively, uh, the cooperation during the COVID crisis has been good. Uh, for instance, to make sure that people see uh, information from trusted sources, if they're looking for information on, uh, on Corona, COVID-19, uh, uh, I think that has been very good. Um, but one of the things that has been clear to me uh, during these uh, times is that it's a matter of urgency uh, that the market is open uh, for entrepreneurs, for scale-ups, for, for, for people with new ideas, uh, because we're not at the last chapter of digitization. Uh, I think we're only getting started. Uh, and that is, of course, why it is so important that uh, not only that, of course, I do my uh, job to, to uh, vigorously enforcing competition law, but also that we get uh, more sort of ex-ante regulation to, to spell out clearly what is the responsibility that you have if you are a digital gatekeeper uh, and, and how to prevent markets from tipping. Because we see that uh, competition, not just in the market for a, 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 a market share, but basically to own that market uh, and be the private regulator. And, and that of, is, of course, perfectly fine if, if the private regulator set rules for fair competition. But we have seen, not in, not in one, not in two, but in, in three Google cases, in the first Amazon case, we see that this is not the, this is not the case. 
uh, we have just opened uh, two Apple cases, one on Apple Pay, uh, one on, on the App Store where there's competition between Apple services and, and other services. So, you know, we need to, we need to combine for, for the market to remain open because we need that drive for, for innovation. Uh, and that I find to be a, a matter of urgency. Uh, we, we regulate, of course, the European market, uh, but, but it, it is an encouragement to see, for instance, how, how the European legislation on, on privacy has inspired a, a global debate about how to make sure that people can be private. And I think that is crucial because in these years when we see all the potential of technology, we should make sure that we create trust, that people trust the technology because otherwise we risk a backslash and we risk that people say, not so much, uh, this is not for me. So I, I think sometimes people underestimate that there is a, a positive side to regulation as well, both when it comes to market opening and when it comes to creating trust among consumers. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft last week, and he said that he'd learned a lot and Microsoft had learned a lot from its tangles with your predecessors at the European Commission. Um, do you feel that the other companies you've been dealing with have been going on that learning journey? Uh, or do you think there's anything they can learn from a company like Microsoft? Or do you find yourself stuck in a rut where you feel like a broken record repeating the same messages and rules back at some of these companies? It's very difficult to say uh, because um, the companies are, are very different. Uh, it may be so that they are called the GAFAs uh, as one, but they are indeed very different. They are different in, in their culture, in, in their leadership. Um, the, the thing that they have in common is that they are really giants. Uh, but, but that being said, they are different. Uh, but of course, to some degree, I worry that, that we did not have one Google case. We had not two, we had three. We've had one Amazon case, uh, now we have a new one. Um, and and we, we unfortunately had to open not one Apple case, but two. Uh, so, so at least there, there is, I think, still a learning potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got, I got one last tough one before we move to the, the audience questions. Um, I'm thinking back to when you find Facebook in 2017 uh, for providing false information in their earlier merger before your time um, between Facebook and WhatsApp. And now Facebook's uh, moving ahead to merge data that it had promised it wouldn't merge between its big services. Um, I'm just wondering, would you like the power to rescind merger approvals like that when you see apps sort of years down the line that, that were out of step with the requirements you put on the decision? Well, well, that is uh, that is a very uh, specific uh, situation, because actually the services back then they they did the analysis uh, that even though Facebook said uh, we will not and we cannot uh, merge the data uh, from WhatsApp and and Facebook, uh, the services they did the analysis uh, anyway. What if they did? Uh, would that be a, a competition uh, problem? And back then they found that, no, that would not be the case. Uh, so in that respect, uh, of course, as you say, we find them because it turned out that they had been given us uh, false information. Um, but I think on, on, on substance, uh, this would not be a case for, for sort of unscrambling the eggs. Uh, and it is indeed very difficult uh, to unscramble the eggs. What, what we want to push is indeed that uh, when we have an antitrust case, uh, we have three different elements in a decision. One is the fine to punish past illegal behavior. Uh, then there is the cease and desist decision. Stop what you're doing. Don't put anything with the same effect in place. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, sort of the, the recovery of competition. How to make competition come back. And, and this is indeed still work in progress. Uh, of course, we haven't seen uh, the effect of, uh, of the um, uh, Android uh, preference menu uh, because very few Android phones have been shipped uh, due to the COVID crisis. Uh, but remains to be seen if uh, when Google is, is pre-installed uh, after the untying uh, and, and other uh, services can be chosen, will that work? Will that sort of open the market uh, for others, uh, search and, and browsers, uh, than the Google uh, choices? Mm -hmm. Now we shift to the audience questions. Um, uh, so this one does come from Brussels, I think, and it was a request to 
hear a little bit about your relationship with your colleague Thierry Breton, the EU Single Market Commissioner, uh, because it is said that he makes a loud case for uh, you know, changing competition rules and allowing some exceptions to them. Um, and your job is to defend the open market. Um, so I think the questioner wants to know whether um, you split the difference on some of these issues or whether he lets you have your space and you let him have his space and, and you, you sort of work in those arrangements. Well, <laughs> it's, it's not really so uh, that we just can say, you do your thing, I do mine, because uh, the commission works as a, as a collegium. Uh, we work together, uh, and I have the responsibility um, for uh, for also sort of making sure that that things uh, fit together. This is this is the point of uh, of being the vice president. Um, but but the thing is, we have a very good cooperation uh, because his mission uh, to make sure that the single market work is, of course, of the essence. One of the reasons why uh, we have U.S. giants here, we have China's giant coming in, is of course they have a single market uh, to grow. Uh, they could scale within a single market. Uh, so one of the things that you know we really truly share is for the single market to work in full. Uh, I very much admire the work being done on the single market enforcement task force uh, that is now being uh, started with member states. Uh, to take every uh, registered barrier down uh, to make sure that the single market really works. Uh, so, so no, um, I think we're based definitely on the same page, even though we come from, from different uh, responsibilities. Muted. <laughs> um, we got a question from Leo Schrank, who's the former CEO at Swift. Um, and his question is, what do you think of the US suspension of negotiations on a digital services tax? What's the next step or the way forward? And that's, I think that's a reference to the OECD process um, where we have heard that everyone else agrees um, within the G20 and the US is the outlier there. Uh, well, obviously I, I very, very much uh, regret this. Uh, I think it was uh, it was a small comfort uh, that the, the withdrawal was was accompanied with uh, wording to suggest that that one was still on board uh, one way or another uh, to have a global consensus uh, because you know we would really really prefer a, a global consensus on the question of uh, of digital taxation. Uh, because we find it so difficult to defend to the many, many, many businesses uh, all over the, the world who pay their taxes, that they have to see that competitors uh, for capital, for skilled employees, for customers, uh, that they do not pay their taxes. Um, so I, I do hope that one way or another we can still uh, move this forward. Uh, because it is really the best thing if we could have a global consensus and then implement that uh, in the different jurisdictions rather than, than us here uh, within Europe uh, having to push this uh, on our own. Uh, of course, our president have asked us to do so if, if we need to, so, so we will, would, of course, do that. But, but it would be the absolute preferable situation uh, that we could have a, a consensus about these issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got a question from Michael Acton now, and it's a state aid question. Um, and so he's asking about Germany's notification of a 100 billion euro recapitalization scheme at the end of March. Um, and he'd like to know why the Commission hasn't approved that yet. Um, is it out of a concern that Germany is already spending too much compared to other member states? Um, we, we do not have a concern that, that Germany uh, spends too much uh, because in, in state aid uh, terms with, with these legal bases, you can, you can only spend uh, what is justified, what is justified. Um, you cannot sort of pop up businesses uh, with subsidies. Um, we have been very busy uh, with a number of, uh, of different schemes, uh, also uh, individual notifications for uh, um, uh, for recapitalization, uh, the Lufthansa case being being the most uh, obvious one, uh, where there is uh, where there is agreement. Uh, so so not it's it's not the size of the scheme. I, I don't know why we're not completely done with it, but uh, but it's not for for any sort of matters of uh, of, of uh, principle. But it's a good illustration of the fact that some can do a lot and is needed to do a lot, 
and they can do it, but others may not be able to do the same thing, even though uh, it may be needed. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it's so important for us uh, that the next generation uh, EU uh, recovery plan is uh, approved uh, one way or another by heads of state and government. And one of the things there that I, I, I really hope that they will endorse is what we call the solvency support instrument, which is a, an instrument to crowd in uh, private investment uh, to businesses who need <clears throat> to, to redo their capital uh, and, and to target this instrument uh, to, to businesses uh, and, and member states uh, who do not have the same uh, sort of fiscal muscle uh, as you would find in Germany. Mm -hmm. Uh, understood. Now, I'm going to combine several questions. We've been getting quite a few in on China. Uh, and so they essentially revolve around how you see the role of Chinese investment in Europe, but they refer to different uh, policies and different projects. And so um, I guess it's about how uh, anti-subsidy proposals uh, complement your work in competition policy. And, you know, the sort of examples given are Chinese financing of the Budapest to Belgrade railway, which uh, one anonymous questioner said is a clear violation of competition rules. So a, a general reaction to how you're going to play um, the, the China situation. Well, we, we do hope, uh, of course, that the, that the white paper on, on foreign subsidy uh, will be uh, preferred reading uh, globally. Uh, so that, that people see uh, our intentions. Uh, uh, what we want to do is, is actually three different things. Um, first, uh, if, you, if you want to acquire a, a European business, you have to notify uh, if you are subsidized to do so. Uh, and then we can figure out on balance, is this uh, good or bad? Does it serve European uh, interest? Uh, if you fail to do so, of course, there are repercussions uh, because the second uh, part of the instrument is a sort of universal um, uh, market tool. Uh, if we see here, get complaints uh, about uh, subsidies that we can, in a two-step uh, procedure, say, well, this is not how things were supposed to be. Uh, you have to share what, uh, what you got uh, from the subsidy. And then the third element, which is very important, that in, uh, in public procurement, if uh, bids are being subsidized, uh, that they can be excluded, uh, maybe once or, or maybe for a longer period of time, uh, in order to have fair competition also in public procurement. Uh, mm -hmm. Because businesses are asked to do their best on quality, on prices, uh, on how they, they deliver. Uh, and it should indeed be on substance and not be a competition about who has the best access uh, to foreign uh, taxpayers. Uh, this, the second thing uh, is uh, sort of the screening uh, of foreign direct investments, where uh, the first things here, they are directed uh, towards competition. The screening of foreign direct investment is directed to issues of uh, a public order uh, and security. And then, of course, uh, the modernized um, trade defenses uh, that we can do if we see that goods may be subsidized outside of Europe and then dumped uh, on the European market. Um, I think it's, it's very important to be vigilant now. And the reason why we push this so, so, uh, uh, so decisively is that we will not sacrifice fair competition and the benefits that comes with it of affordable prices, of innovation, of good services, uh, we will fight the unfair competition. Because otherwise, of course, the risk is that we just uh, launch a, a, a grotesque uh, subsidy race. Uh, and that, that doesn't make the most efficient uh, use of resources. And it definitely do not uh, serve customers uh, and consumers well. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got some more questions about uh, Chinese policy innovation and whether you'd be open to certain ideas. So I'll just throw two of them at you. Um, one is from Sigrid Johannesa, who's a Dutch uh, policy advisor. Uh, and she asked, is restricting global high-tech exports to China a good way to mitigate risks and uh, change behavior? And then the other point is around uh, fair competition in the media space, which is notoriously hard uh, to regulate and people get in trouble when they try to. But the point um, this person is making is that Chinese media um, have free access to what the West provides, whether it's platforms and its media, but European uh, Western internet um, platforms, media outlets don't get a fair shot in China. So 
can is that something that can be dealt with by the EU at any point in its policy making? Uh, I, I wouldn't know about uh, the timing. Um, well, we have found that it was uh, a, a real big problem, and and I, I do take uh, take sort of the the tone in in this question uh, that there is a huge problem of reciprocity, uh, and we find that as well, which is why the Commission has has uh, tabled a proposal. Uh, that proposal is is targeted uh, procurement. Uh, it's called the International Procurement Instrument. And, and the idea here is to say you're more than welcome to do business in Europe, but we would also want to be welcome to do business with you. Uh, where I grew up in, in the western part of Denmark, uh, if you invite people over and they don't invite you back, uh, eventually you stop inviting. Uh, and, and I think we, we need to push for, for reciprocity uh, also outside uh, of procurement. Uh, because uh, market access uh, and, and for that to work both ways is indeed uh, of the essence. Um, and as, as said, uh, the European rules should, should go with everyone. Uh, and we do indeed see, indeed see uh, more and more of the Chinese uh, digital uh, giants uh, being uh, part of, of the European market. Mm -hmm. It's nearly time to wrap up. So maybe I'll throw in one question. Uh, because we didn't actually talk about the state of the transatlantic alliance um, and i know you're a passionate supporter of that um could you give us a a, a scorecard or a, a sentiment ranking of, of where you see the alliance as being at right now and and what if anything would you like to see changed uh, in the coming months and years we we share so fundamental values uh, we have such a long history uh, together. And, and right now, we are not making best use of, of, of that, that value of, of sharing fundamentals and, and having a common history uh, in a world that is changing so dramatically. Um, because the, the geopolitics uh, today are so different as to what they were uh, just five, ten years ago. Uh, and I would really wish uh, for the, the US-EU uh, relationship uh, to be stronger. Uh, a good expression of that is the proposal uh, that my colleague Phil Hogan has made uh, to establish a US-EU uh, Trade uh, and Technology Council uh, to have a, a structured uh, place to, to discuss this and to push for uh, common approaches. Um, uh, the, the idea of, uh, of open uh, liberal democracies uh, is being challenged uh, these years, also systemically. Uh, and, and that I, I think we should, we should confront together uh, because in, in that we would be so much stronger. Uh, so with, with the background, with the values, uh, I think we have much to do to, to make much better use uh, of that potential uh, in a world that is so much more challenging uh, than what it was. Margrethe Vestager, it's hard to overstate uh, the influence that you do have in EU policy circles. So we really appreciate that you've taken the time uh, to elevate this conversation and answer the questions in such depth. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm now going to turn it over to Benjamin Haddad, who is the director of the Atlantic Council's Future Europe Initiative for some wrap up remarks. Thanks again. Could I just say thank you uh, to you? I, I really appreciate the way this conversation has been, been moderated. So thank you very much for, uh, for your effort. A pleasure. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Ben Haddad. I'm the director of the Future Europe Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. And I'd like to uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for this ninth Atlantic Council front page conversation. Thank you, Ryan, for a great job at moderating and thanks, thanks to our friends at, at Politico for, for sharing this event. But really, thank you, Madam Executive Vice President, for your leadership on one of Europe's most important portfolio, especially in this time of crisis. And thank you for taking the time to speak to our audience today in the United States and in Europe. The Atlantic Council is founded on the mission that the United States is stronger with its allies. As we, we face an unprecedented economic crisis, health crisis, as our societies are reckoning on both sides of the Atlantic with issues of race and identity, mm -hmm. the risk of looking inward has never been greater. 
And this is why the Atlantic Council, these last few months, we've gone on offense, keeping our friends and allies close and making the case for our common values and the need to shape a rules-based order. And the relationship with the European Union as a core strategic partner of the United States is more than ever critical. On all the challenges that you mentioned, Madam Vice President, from dealing with new technologies to ensuring a level playing field with China, we do believe that the EU and the US are stronger together. You said it in your conclusion, uh, we should confront those together in a world that is getting more complex. And I want to assure you that you can count on the Atlantic Council for making that case as well. In the next few weeks, we'll continue with our work. And I'd just like to mention two events to people viewing today. Uh, our next uh, AC front page event will be tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, June 24th at 9.30 a.m. Uh, for uh, the United States with Germany's defense minister and great cramp Karen Bohr that you know as AKK. And on Thursday, the 25th, we will launch our new paper, The EU and the Search for Digital Sovereignty, Building Fortress Europe or Preparing for a New World. Uh, uh, this paper is uh, co-signed by our uh, FEI senior fellows, Fran Burwell and Ken Prop. You can find the paper on our website and join us for the conversation at 10.30 a.m. on Thursday with the member of European Parliament, Axel Voss, Rupert Schlegemisch, who is the Director for Trade at the European Commission, Ken Prop and Fran Burwell, and Ambassador Karen Batia, VP at Google. That will be on Thursday morning. Join us for these two events and thank you again for, for joining us. Thank you, Madam Vice President. And with this, uh, have a great day, everyone. Likewise. Bye-bye. <laughs>